I think what we will see is a continued radicalization of the left that will view this as basically the return of historic fascism and totalitarianism and will catastrophize, um, I think, to a level that we we didn't even see in 2016. And, and that, I think, in turn, will, will continue this spiral of, of polarization. Welcome to Conversations with Peter Bogosian. Today I have on my friend, Matt Goodwin, the academic, and we have a very spirited conversation about immigration and a wide variety of issues. Thank you. Matt Goodwin, welcome. Thanks for having me back. My pleasure. Your interview was a huge success last time. So let's jump right into it. Are the British Tories dead? The British Conservative Party is dying. That's what we're witnessing at the moment. This is one of the most successful political parties in the history of democracy. It's always been successful because it's renewed its ideology, it's renewed its philosophy. Margaret Thatcher, Winston mm. Churchill, Boris Johnson, we can go through all the famous British Tories over the years. But what we're seeing today, 2024, with a massive election on the horizon, I think now is actually the death of the British Conservative Party, a party that has fundamentally come unstuck from the voters who put it into power at the last election. What are they at, 20% now? What's the... So in early 24, as we're speaking, the Conservatives are averaging just 22% of the national vote. To put that in perspective, they won over 40% of the vote at the last election with Boris Johnson. Now, why is this happening? Yeah. It's happening because at the last election, the British Tories gave the world a masterclass in how to deliver a political realignment. They won over working class voters, non-graduate voters, older voters, people who care passionately about limiting immigration, who wanted to leave the European Union. But in the space of only four years, they've gone from that to giving the world instead a masterclass in how to lose touch with a realignment. So if you actually look at the British Tories through a global lens, the reason I think this really matters, if you yeah. compare them to the American Republicans, yeah, yeah. the Swedish Conservatives, the French Conservatives, the Italian Conservatives, the Hungarian Conservatives, the British Tories now are the odd ones out. They've lost sight of the people they need. They don't really know what they believe anymore and they don't know where they're going anymore. So I think the Tories really are now on critical life support. It's, and so the, the Tories know this? Some of the Tories know this, but the what I would call the establishment Tories, the old guard, the Tory clubs, I think they view this election as, as just a blip, an unfortunate defeat before they regroup. What I'm saying, Peter, is... This is actually the beginning of the end for the British Conservative Party. Wow. I think we are going to see increasingly the British Tories be replaced by something altogether different. Wow, that's so in 10 years from now, you don't think there'll be a Tory party or there'll be just a fringe party? Well, I think if you look through political history, there have been three interesting moments where in a first past the post majoritarian system, one party has been replaced by another. So in Britain, the Liberal Party in the early 20th century was replaced by the Labour Party. Mm. In Canada in the early 1990s, the progressive conservatives were replaced by the Reform, a more cultural conservative party. And in the 1980s, we had a, a party here called the Social Democrat Party, yeah, yeah. which came very close to replacing the Labour Party and arguably set the foundation for Tony Blair. The key point is that what we're going to see over the next, I think, one to three years is a new push by national conservatives, not establishment Tories, national conservatives who have a very different philosophy. We'll come on and talk about that. Yeah. They are going to push the Tories hard now and say, you no longer represent the vast majority of voters in this country. If anything, you sold them down the river. Okay, so w this is a global audience. And one of the things that I'm always curious about is what's the relationship between Labour and Democrats and conservatives and Tories and Republicans. Yeah, so that's why I think you know, American politics is very instructive here. If you look at, say, how Donald Trump has realigned the Republican movement, um, he obviously basically took out the kind of Mitt Romney's, the, uh, the sort of neoliberal conservatives, right? Um, and has repackaged the Republican movement yeah. around- And, the, and the, the neocons, is that- The neocons, also, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's repackaged the movement around anti-immigration, tough on crime, economic protectionism, uh, critical of the state, critical of woke social justice ideology. 
He's basically reshaped that ideological movement. The British Tories haven't realised yet that that is the direction of travel that conservatism basically is going to need to move in order to survive over the longer term. They are still in a kind of neocon view. The Conservative Party, the institutions of the party, the apparatus of the party are still dominated basically by liberal conservatives who are comfortable with globalisation, comfortable with free trade, comfortable with a London-based economy. They don't see immigration as an issue. And if I said woke to them or social justice ideology, most of them would say, well, isn't that just about being nice? Isn't that just about, <laughs> you know, being a nice, fluffy liberal? They do not understand how the tectonic plates of politics have changed, which is why they are on 22% of the vote right, right. and why those conservatives who have understood how it's changed from Georgia Maloney to the Sweden Democrats to Donald Trump looking at his recent results in Iowa and I suspect also New Hampshire they have realized the direction of travel and would you put, put Pine Fortune from the Netherlands in that basket too Gert Wilders uh, Gert Wilders who, I'm sorry yeah, Gert, Gert Wilders, Wilders yeah. who recently um, yeah smashed that election uh, I would and I would also put put in the likes of the Austrian Freedom Party Chega in Portugal Vox in Spain Viktor Orban in Hungary. Look, because there's a new generation of conservatives, right, who are critical of free trade, critical of hyper-globalization. They absolutely loathe hyper-liberalism right, and right. The, the woke agenda. But also, they really dislike established conservatives who basically went along with this agenda, who basically sold no. their countries down the river. And the British Tories, I'll give you one example. Yeah. The British Tories really did this in an unbelievable way. Boris Johnson, for international viewers, will think, oh, Boris Johnson is a conservative, right? He's a charismatic, slightly bumbling character who looked a little bit perhaps like Winston right. Churchill and he hair, just seemed hair. very yeah. kind of British and whatever. Yeah. Boris Johnson was actually not a conservative. Boris Johnson was what David Brooks would have called a bobo, a bourgeoisie bohemian. He liberalized the immigration system. He made it much easier for people from outside of Europe to come to Britain, often low skill, low wage migration, which we know has a net fiscal cost on the economy. It's, it's taking more out than it's putting in. And he even removed the requirement for companies to advertise jobs in Britain before advertising them in India and Nigeria and elsewhere. So the idea that Boris Johnson was a conservative is absurd. And the key point in all of this is voters now are finally beginning to realise the extent to which the Tories basically took that Brexit agenda, that big agenda that said, give us control of the borders, give us lower migration, prioritise popular sovereignty, give us a, a self-governing independent nation, They've now realized, I think, the extent to which the Tories have sold them down the river, and that is going to create space for something different. Can you draw a parallel between Democrats and Labour? The Democrats and Labour historically have had very strong links. So Bill Clinton, Tony Blair, you know, the New Democrats, New Labour, that was a sort of basis of, of that relationship. And then essentially what happened is the British Labour Party had this curious... Um, some might say ridiculous experiment with with a radical left leader, Jeremy Corbyn, has since moved back to the centre, to the sort of more moderate centre with Sir Keir Starmer, who I would bet today will be our next prime minister, and have basically come to a similar view, I think, as some Democrats in saying, if we're going to get back to power, we have to do some uncomfortable things in the short term. We have to embrace Brexit or at least accept that, that people voted to leave the European Union. We have to talk a little bit about getting tough on crime, a bit like Tony Blair did in the 1990s. And we have to maybe say, well, illegal migration is making us a bit uncomfortable. But once Labour get into office, once they win this election, I think a bit like Joe Biden has done and the Democrats have done, they're going to quickly come unstuck because they're going to be overwhelmed. They have no serious plan for illegal migration. That's going to increase. They, they have no serious plan for legal immigration. That's going to increase. Um, the fiscal pressure on Britain over the next five years is going to be immense because of high levels of national debt, no productivity. Labour will almost certainly have to break its tax um, pledges in its manifesto. So the, what I'm saying is like Biden, I think actually Labour are quickly going to come unstuck. And if you look at the polling in America, you know, my money would be on Donald Trump returning to the White House yeah, I because I think voters have become very disillusioned with Biden's agenda and the lack of uh, results. And in the same way, I think 
three to five years from now, the Brits are going to become very disillusioned with the Labour Party. In fact, they might become very disillusioned very quickly after this election when yeah. they realise that Labour's not really going to change that much at all. Are there any issues in the UK, the major issues that are not issues in the US and vice versa? Like, well, obviously it's geolocalized to Brexit, but for example, the deficit is, is uh, inflation, immigration, maybe more abortion in the US, but... It, it, or the culture war stuff, maybe the trans stuff, you know, Vivek Ramaswamy made that part of his platform. Are there any issues that affect people here that don't affect, like what are the big, are yeah. there any big issues? Yeah. Well, in America, obviously religion is a bigger influence on politics. The abortion debate is much more salient. I'd push back on you a little bit in saying, I don't like the phrase culture wars. Okay. So when we refer to culture wars and we talk about free speech, women's sex-based rights, the rights of children to be free of things like critical race theory right. or gender identity theory. I don't think those are culture wars. I think those are about the foundations of civilization. I think I, I agree, many yeah. conservatives, and I would describe myself probably as a, as a conservative, have ceded that territory to, 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 to radical progressives by allowing all of that territory to be repackaged as, as culture wars. So I don't think that is really um, is a good term. But there are lots of similarities. The key difference, though, is Americans, I think, have discovered the political significance of raising the salience of the social justice ideology, the influence of wokeism in the institutions in a way that hasn't yet happened in uh -huh. Britain. Because, you know, if you go back to some of the classics in social science, why was Britain different from other advanced Western democracies? Why is it that the Brits never did what the Germans and the Italians did with fascism? Well, the argument going back to books like the civic culture was because we had a very nice political culture. We valued tolerance and pluralism and um, we were not interested in messianic figures and the Brits were kind of, you know, we were just nice. I think what's beginning to change now is that more and more people are realizing that actually this thing that says it's liberal, this thing that says it's nice, isn't really nice, and that it's sacrificing free speech and free expression on the altar of a very radical political ideology. And I think finally Brits are beginning to understand the extent to which that's happening in schools, universities, and so on. And if the Tories were clever, which they're not, but if they were clever, they would be increasing the salience of that issue like some of the American Republicans have because that's an issue that the vast majority of people care about. So I was in, Reed and I were in Parliament with Lawrence Fox and a woman, she was an MP, she came up to us and she heard us speaking and she said, you're American and I said, yes. And literally I'd never seen this woman before. She said one thing to us and then she walked away. She said, there used to be a time when we trusted what the president of the United States had to say. And then she walked away. And I was, <laughs> I mean, I was, rather, I was, I was rather struck by that, given that I had never seen her before, nor since. And I mentioned that to the context of if Trump wins it, and, mm. and certainly when you look at the polling data, Trump, Biden, Trump wins, uh, Trump, Gavin Newsom, Trump wins, Trump... RFK, Trump wins. You yeah. just go down, yeah, Trump yeah. wins across sure. the board. What would be the perception of a Trump victory here on the island? Well, the first thing is, I agree with you. I think Trump will probably win that election. And I think looking at the data from the early primaries, one of the things that very few conservatives in Europe have understood is the extent to which Trump still is maintaining that realignment from 2016. In fact, if anything, he's extending it. Two data points I find fascinating in America one is the extent to which Hispanic Latino voters are moving from left to right. Right. I think that's Correct. fascinating because it turns on its head the idea that demography is destiny, yeah, yeah. which liberals like to say, right? That eventually if you have more Clearly diversity, right. you have more, more liberalism. So that's one of the interesting things. And the second thing is he's actually getting stronger, not weaker among younger voters, which again flies in the face of the idea that we're all on a kind of conveyor belt into embracing liberalism because I don't think I that's true. I love that phrase, a conveyor belt to embracing liberalism. Especially among young men, by the way, yeah, yeah, young, yeah. especially among non-graduate men. Yeah. What would be the perception here? Yeah. On the right, it would cause the conservatives, I hope, to realize just how badly they managed this similar realignment that's happening. Because if Trump wins, he's winning with blue-collar voters, non-graduates, 
older voters, cultural conservatives, and he's doing so while turning the volume up to 10 on the issues like migration, um, CRT in schools, border security, you know, taking on China, you know, talking tough on Russia, all those sorts of things. Um, the Tories, I think, would look at that and realize that is the campaign they should have they should yeah. have run, and that is the direction they should probably go. Liberals, meanwhile, Labour uh, supporters, MPs, and activists, meanwhile, I think what we will see is a continued radicalization of the left that will view this as basically the return of historic fascism and totalitarianism, and will catastrophize. Um, I think to a level that we we didn't even see in 2016, and and that I think in turn. Will will continue this spiral of of polarization. Yeah, I, I was gonna, I was just going to ask that. Do you think that will further radicalize and entrench the left from Argentina to the Netherlands to actually Sweden uh, to Hungary to Italy? I mean, do, do you think that that will radicalize labor? Well, not just labor. I wrote a book in 2018 called National Populism, yeah, yeah. in which um, my colleague uh, Professor Roger Eatwell and I argued that the likes of Trump and Le Pen and Maloney were only going to become stronger, not just because the salience of cultural issues like migration was just going to keep increasing, because nobody has got an answer to this global migration crisis yet, but also because the left were responding so badly to God, it. It's crazy, right? And you've it? seen you've yeah. seen that here too, in response to Brexit and Boris Johnson, no prominent serious figure in British politics has come out and said, Do you know what? If we don't respond to these voters, this is just going to keep going and going and going. Let's let's slash migration. Let's leave whatever international court we need to leave to There's bring back no border security. Let's di let's let's bring genuine viewpoint diversity into politics. Let's shake up who we've got in the institutions. Nobody said that. So what we're going to see is the continued rise of these movements. They're going to become stronger and more present. And I think for people on the left, I genuinely think twenty four is going to be another 2016, but worse. I think it is really? going to really shock a lot of people because it's going to force a lot of folks on the liberal left to realize nearly 10 years on from 2016, nearly 10 years on from the Brexit and Trump revolts that first pulled back the curtain on this problem, they're going to be forced to grapple with the fact that they can't fix this. There are no answers. They're not winning the debate. They're not winning the argument. Voters are carrying on, basically ignoring... Uh, what they've been saying, still turning to these renegade outsiders. And I think that's where we're going to see probably the imposition of speech codes, social norms, that the public square will become narrower, the Overton window, will, will they'll try and keep it as narrow as possible. And I don't think that's a sustainable strategy because in Britain, one thing we've seen over the last 10 years, and you've, you've contributed to this, you know, we've seen the proliferation of a new media landscape. We've got new television channels. We've got GB News, Talk TV. We've got really big YouTube shows. We've got really big substacks. We've got, you know, a new ecosystem of alternative media. And a lot of that isn't, this isn't like, you know, radical media. This is what I would consider to be basically where the average voter is on a lot of these issues. But if that's happened in just seven or eight years, you know, what's it going to be like when we get to the 2030s? And the established voices in the institutions have still not responded to voters. And I think this stuff is going to go on steroids. And we'll see the legacy institutions increasingly yeah, yeah. be challenged. I was just thinking that about the BBC. So one of the things that we've been talking about is that if Trump does win, we are, as an American, I'm concerned that there's going to be civil unrest in blue cities. Are you at, is there any, any even a hint of... The possibility of civil unrest depending upon who is the next leader. Not in Britain. We don't really do do that in a major way. Now, not, not linked to politics, but I'll come back to that point. What worries me about America while we're having this conversation is the extent to which affective polarization has taken root in American society. Yeah. So politics has bled into relationships, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. One of the stats that uh, that I read recently was that only 5% of registered Democrats and Republicans have married somebody from the other side. So it's a good indication of just how deep-rooted that polarization is and how it's it's bleeding out into, into wider society. And I, I did ask a prominent American academic recently who will remain nameless because he might not want me to, 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 to say this publicly. But I said, you know, do you think the United States of America will be 
will be hanging together in 20, 30 years. And he said, probably we will see some blue states beginning to lobby to leave or beginning to perhaps exit and, and leave the United States. I told Reid that. Yeah. Um, just, yep. And this guy, I mean, if I said his name, everybody would know immediately who he is, yep. a really prominent guy. We won't have civil unrest linked to politics. We will have civil unrest linked to immigration. And there's a difference. We, we've oh, already had it. We've already yeah, had it. We've had serious... Uh, it, it spell that out for, for well, us. Well, we've already had serious riots in cities like Leicester, which yeah, is... Yeah which is ironic because Leicester was once held up as the example of how wonderful multicultural society is. We've had young British uh, youths basically fighting with one another in the streets over conflicts uh, overseas. We've had endless protests and demonstrations after October 7th where uh, we've had predominantly Muslim protesters um, just, voicing yeah. anti-Semitism in the streets. And we've had, um, I think, some pretty nasty examples of, of the I think Britain importing foreign conflicts and then seeing the consequence of those conflicts playing out on Britain's streets. And, and the reality behind all of this, the key point behind all of this is multiculturalism as a policy yeah. is not working anymore. And I say that because multiculturalism prioritizes group differences over commonality and encourages society to recognize and celebrate minority identities at the expense of the majority identity and leaves people within the majority feeling as though their distinctive identity, culture, heritage, and history are being downgraded or eroded at the expense of people who have arrived in the community more recently. And, and that that's is, how you've de you define multiculturalism. Yeah, I think the policy of multiculturalism is, is clearly failing. Uh, Suella Braverman, a uh, member of parliament, former cabinet minister, said yeah. this recently and was widely attacked by commentators who then a few weeks after she said that, mused out loud, well, how come I feel so unsafe in, in London as a British Jew looking at these protests after October 7th? The point, Peter, is yeah. if you are a realist and you look at how the policies of mass migration and zero integration policy, how they're colliding with this kind of social justice left that's sort of spreading these narratives of, of victimhood and um, group-based identities. You know, we've got a really big problem here, and we're going to need some really robust political leadership to sort it out. Okay, let me, so let me pu push back on that. Sikhs, I, I don't know the data, but I would bet you that Sikhs are responsible for a disproportionately low amount of crime. Is that right? Um, I'd need to look at the data, but instinctively, I think that's broadly what I'd expect to that's find. That's what I would expect as well. So it's not, so, so not all people from all countries are the same. Not all demographics are the same. There are certain demographics that, for example, when communities increase the number of people from this demographic, Jewish people might flee. But I don't think you can say that. I'm just pulling Sikhs out of, or Jains, for example. If I don't think there are any communities of Jains in London, although mm. I don't really know. Mm. So the the um, brush of multiculturalism, a broad brush, don't we need to disambiguate that or really narrow that, define that, and narrow that down? Does that make sense? Well, as a, yeah. yes, but I think when you're... There's a, there's a debate about what type of migration do we have and should we have? And then there's a debate about is the policy that has been designed to help integrate that migration working? And the answer to the second question I would say is no, just given the reality of what's happening in Britain today. We do not have a successful, integrated, multicultural society. I, I simply do not think we have that. And a realist who looks around at communities in Northern England or East London or the east coast of England, we'll see that immediately, that we have highly segregated communities where there is very little like genuine in interaction. Oh, uh, Burnley, uh, That's where Bradford, we wanted, we wanted to go uh, Oldham, with you to Whitechapel. Rochdale, I uh, could go on and on. I mean, I, mean I, I, I spent a lot of time in northern England in my life, and um, some of those communities are the opposite of integrated. And, and I, I, don't, I think we should be able to talk about this and say, why is this happening? It's happening... I think mainly because of the type of migration that we've been encouraging into the country. We have now got an immigration policy that is mainly focused on um, bringing people from outside of Europe into Britain who are often um, low skill, low wage, 
culturally distinctive, often not always coming from predominantly Muslim uh, countries, and as a recent study at the University of Amsterdam has shown, are more lo- more likely to be a net fiscal cost to the economy. Eric Kaufman was just talking uh, about that. More likely yesterday. to be a net fiscal cost to take more out than to put into the economy, but also culturally, socially, uh, and in terms of religion, um, very distinctive from from the majority. And, and I just want, I want to apologize yeah. because this is so important. So I know people are going to be watching this and they're thinking, oh my God, there are these two white white guys there. So this is nothing to do with race. We're talking about very discreet. This is nothing to do with race. And 93% of Brits, by the way, today, something, by the way, I would also say and would support and why I always talk about this stat because it's important. If you look at, say, Ipsos Murray, which is a really reliable pollster, they find that between 93 and 95% of Brits say you don't need to be white to be British, right? So the idea that we have a kind of tight ethnic conception of who we are is just not really true. There's probably somewhere around two or three percent of the country that would still hold that view. But at the same time, many Brits would also say the the traditions and the values and the institutions and the ways of life that they associate with the ethno-traditional majority group are really important. And so too, by the way, with lots of minority Brits. I mean, there's a reason, for example, that one in three black and minority ethnic Britons voted for Brexit because they too valued the institutions and the history and the the ways of life that, that they also associate with the country. So it's certainly not about race, but what it is about is can we create a successful, integrated society Um, When we are doing two things, when we are ushering in record levels of mass migration, uh, 700,000 at the moment is our net migration target, uh, while having no serious integration policy at all. That to me is a recipe for disaster. Uh, That to me is total insanity. That's kind of where where we are. That's cultural suicide. That's complete Um, insanity. So no Brit, including myself, by the way, would say we want zero immigration and we want to start, you know, deporting people who are playing by the rules uh, and and so on that. But what, um, as we saw actually recently, we had a study which found that um, 90% of all seats in the country, all parliamentary constituencies in the country have a majority for lowering migration and strengthening the borders. So for people on Twitter who are going to shout at me when this debate comes out, who say, oh, no, actually, we, we should have more immigration, we should have relaxed controls, we should have open borders. That's like a yeah. that's like a 10% position. By the way, by the way, just to be crystal clear with you, we have tried to get those people on to have a conversation. They refuse to talk. They absolutely refuse to talk. Yeah. So if you want to go and you want to cry about it, great. We've invited them on. They haven't come. So I'm curious. The Rwanda bill. Yeah. T- t- talk, t- I find that. Fa- I read your sub stack on that. I, f- I find that fascinating because we had talked about that in our, our first conversation. T- talk, talk to me about that. So we have a growing illegal migration problem with over 110,000 people entering Britain illegally on small boats crossing the channel from France. And your total population in this country is what? Like 65 million. Like when you see, compare it to say America's illegal migration problem, it's a it's 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 not really a, much of an issue at all. But what it is doing is it is completely undermining Britain's claim to be a self-governing, independent country that is control of its own borders. So how do you fix the problem? Well, there's two approaches. The Labour Party, which will likely be in government in 2024, yeah. they say. What you should do is you should focus on smashing the people smuggling gangs in France and Belgium and elsewhere who are bringing these people to the coast of France with a boat and a, and a couple of life jackets and they're saying, good luck, England's that way. Um, our national crime agency, which is like America's FBI, have said smashing the gangs is not going to work. It's like whack-a-mole because if you get rid of one, there's another one that pops up. You get rid of that one, there's another one that pops up. So what they say, and these are you know security officials, they say what you need alongside that is an active deterrent. You need a credible threat of deportation, which is if you come to Britain, like the Australians did, if you come to the country illegally, you will immediately be removed in this case, to Rwanda, African state. Yeah, they you have will, man asylum. You'll have your claim yeah. processed there. Yeah. And if you lose your claim, whatever, you can stay in Rwanda or you can go back to where, wherever you came from. And that's the idea that, that essentially Rishi Sunak has latched onto to say we need an active deterrent. The problem 
is he's also been pushing that idea in a way that leaves a number of crucial legal loopholes. Okay, let me ask you two questions. One, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but real quick. When we invited people to talk about that, nobody would come. Why do you think that is? It's Why? a controversial policy. Yeah, but it's a controversial policy and you're here. It's a controversial policy among the elite. Look, the more people in this country support the Rwanda plan than oppose it. But if you're, a, let's say, a social liberal London-based commentator, Rwanda is basically like a sort of Nazi-style policy that is you know, about chucking people out of the country and not caring about them. I would argue, in reply to those people, this is actually about saving lives. This is about people not leaving the safe country of France, risking their lives, jumping in a, in a, in a little boat in what Didn't is the you. busiest crossing in, I think, the Western world, I think I'm right in saying the channel, and risking their lives and coming over because we don't have the courage and we don't have the leadership to make it clear both to the gangs and to those migrants who are mainly young men between the ages of 18 and 39. There are very few women and children coming over that if you do this, um, we will process your claim elsewhere. We need to have an active deterrent. And this is where the civil war in conservatism comes in, Peter, because Rishi Sunak and the established Tories are trying to do this in a way that will leave legal loopholes, that will allow an individual to say, well, I'm going to challenge this in the courts. I'm not going to go to Rwanda because I'm going to argue that, you know, I, I could be subjected to discrimination or harassment. National conservatives, a smaller group, but I think an increasingly powerful group in British politics, like perhaps a bit like Ron DeSantis and Trump and that wing of the Republican Party, they're saying the only way a deterrent works is if it's watertight. Because if people think that they can come over and exploit legal loopholes, what's the point of having a deterrent? Like it's not going to work. If you're going to do this, you need to do it so nobody who makes a crossing can go to the courts in a foreign country using international lawyers to uh, find a loophole to okay. stop them being deported. And this is important because if we get this right, the reason I go on about this and the reason many people find me slightly provocative is I'll tell you exactly why I'm worried. If we don't solve this problem, democratic legitimacy is going to go out the window. Public trust in politics is going to collapse. Britain will have somebody that will look like Donald Trump, but probably worse. Okay. So since nobody who advances that position will have a conversation about it, I think it's incumbent upon us, particularly I'm asking you to do this, to steel man the position. Mm -hmm. What is the argument that a thoughtful, smart, sane person would make for being against the Rwanda bill, for increasing illegal immigration, for increasing legal immigration? Like, wh what, what is the argument that someone would make for that? So if you were against the Rwanda policy, you would say something like, this is an inhumane policy that is sending people to an African state where they might suffer persecution and discrimination. And that instead of doing that, what we should do is have more safe and legal routes where refugees around the world can come into the UK legally. And we should focus our efforts not on creating a deterrent, but on smashing the gangs who are bringing people into the country in the first place. Okay. And, and then they'd also say something okay. like the people who do come into Britain illegally, once their claims are processed, they make a valuable and important contribution to the economy and to our national life. And so those people, my guess is that they wouldn't differentiate, for example, between immigrants from Pakistan and immigrants from Vietnam. Oh, we don't have that debate at all, no. These are just people in need that we should help. Okay. And so would they say there's any limit to the number of people who, I mean, just open the borders? But that's the thing, Literally right? so anybody who wants that's, to come so in. That, that's the question. What's the upper limit? So if we weren't going to do this Rwanda plan, if we weren't yeah. going to have a deterrent, if we weren't going to process people in a third country, what's what's the upper limit? Well, the reason that well, I, the reason is what I, I can't them. answer what's the, the, upper limit? the question is because no one will talk to me. It's not, talk it's to not only it. that, it's because a lot of those people are pro-immigration activists who basically favor open borders. That's basically what's happening. So if I press people and say, okay, you want safe and legal routes for more people to come into Britain legally. Okay, what's the upper limit? 100,000? 
200,000, 300,000. Uh, we've got a global, million? we've got a global migration crisis with, with millions of people around the, around the world looking to come. And also, what impact do you think that would have globally if Britain said loudly, we're not going to do Rwanda, we're going to have more safe and legal routes? What do you think would be the impact of that? Oh, I, I can tell you exactly what the impact of that would be. <laughs> and so I don't think people are being real. I don't think they're being intellectually honest. I've tried to have that debate with people on the left, and it basically comes down to Thomas Sowell's conflict of visions. I mean, that yeah. they are essentially about you know universalism, open borders or certainly more relaxed borders, and any push towards lower migration, towards strengthening borders, is is seen as increasingly seen as a far right political enterprise. Okay, so let's let's say that we wave a magic wand, and at the end the folks who are against the Rwanda bill, the folks who want open borders, who are not truly bothered, not really bothered by illegal immigration, say there's no upper limit. Let's say, let's say they get their way and they, they, I don't know, win might be too strong a word, but let's just say they get their way. What does that look like in 25 years? Well, the first thing to say is they probably will get their way because even though that's a 5 to 10% position, those people tend to dominate the institutions. They also tend to dominate the Labour Party, which is about to win the election. So we are going to have a softer approach to illegal migration. So what would happen over the next 20, 30 years? Firstly, if we maintain current levels of legal migration in this country, and by that I mean about 1.2 million people coming into the country every year, net migration levels of about 700,000, that would mean that by the time we get to about 2040, about 2040 to 2045, uh, we would need 10 cities the size of Birmingham to accommodate those people. Birmingham is our second city after London. For or those they'd who just aren't be sleeping in tents. Or they'd be sleeping in tents, but we would need to basically be, uh, we, because immigration is already the main driver of our population growth, we would need a lot more housing. We'd need a lot more room for those people. Um, it would also profoundly change the character of the country. So if you look at the Pew uh, think tank, the Pew Research Center, which is not a right-wing think tank, it is a very liberal centrist kind of think tank, they estimate that between now and 2045, the share of Britain's population that is Muslim will go from 6% to about 18 19%. It's coming up to about 20%. So that's going to be a significant shift. I'm trying to think about it from their point of view. So for them, if it decreases the, net, the character of the country and the sovereignty, that would be a good thing. If it weakens the institutions, that would be a good thing. If it pulls people out of poverty, out of extreme poverty, even, even their life would be better if they lived in a tent. I was just in um, Liverpool and I saw, the first time I've been in Europe, I saw three people living in tents. Um, you would need a massive infrastructure. You would need massive taxes to support the population. But they would believe that those are all good things, right? Well, they don't. I would argue as a critic of, I'm, I would describe myself as a critic of mass immigration. For, I give you one stat, which, which came out recently and I think says a lot. Britain currently is building 190,000 new homes every year. The government's target is to build 300,000. And those are mainly for young Brits, young families that can't get on the housing ladder. Right, order. terrible, terrible, terrible. If we maintain current migration levels, we need to build at least 515,000 homes every year just to keep up with the demand for migration. Now, we don't have a debate about that in this country. We don't have a debate about population growth and a housing crisis because that's considered taboo. We shouldn't talk about that. We don't have a debate about how migration is going to change the character of the country, the ways of life in the country. And there's another debate that we can't talk about, which yeah. is how certain forms of migration over the years have produced some very unsavory, very ugly things in certain communities in England, the most prominent of which we've just had a report, as you and I are talking this week, is the sexual exploitation of mainly young, white, working class girls by Pakistani Muslim gangs. We've just had another independent report this week right. that has basically said over the last 20 years, that was endemic. Now, simply by me saying this to you, 
I will be attacked and I will be um, well. That's just the dis- data described the as that's I just, will be described as a, a provocateur. But right? that's just that's just what the data shows. That's what the data shows. It's what the police have confirmed. It's what anybody who's ever looked at that issue has confirmed, which is that organized gang-based grooming is disproportionately undertaken by Pakistani males who bring those cultural practices with them from mainly impoverished parts of Pakistan and elsewhere. So it's a kind of clan-based uh, uh, system, which is permitted within certain communities in England or at least ignored. And as a consequence, the reason I raise this, Peter, and we're not talking about like 10 girls, we're talking about yeah, thousands, thousands of girls and women, one of whom, by the way, in the papers this week was kept in a cage, a 15-year-old girl, was kept in a cage, treated like a dog, and then given a fatal overdose of heroin when the gang didn't really want to abuse her anymore. So these yeah. are the things that we're talking about. And when we look at migration and the impact on public services, on, on housing, on society, on crime... Um, what frustrates me about this country is that we're not actually a serious country. We we don't actually debate these issues in a serious, sensible you don't way. Even talk about them. And yeah. if you do violate the social norms, you are basically then pushed out of the public square. And I just don't think that's a serious place for us to be. And if we don't do that, what we'll see is what America has seen. Right? You'll see increasingly people just circumventing the public square, the established legacy institutions, and saying, "Well, if you're not going to have this conversation," We'll have it elsewhere. Well, I, I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, you wouldn't see this conversation on the BBC. You, you wouldn't see this conversation on any legacy media outlet. You'd need a podcast, et cetera. Okay, so let's go back to this idea that people who are very much pro-immigration, they're, they don't differentiate between where people come from in the world. And then they're showing the Nottingham stats or whatever the stats about grooming. I'm trying to think of is the... I'm, try, I'm trying to think of their response. Is, I don't think, I could be wrong about this, but I don't think that their response would be, oh, that's just their culture and that's just how they do things. And, or it could oh, I don't be know what their response would be, which is- A they, sin of colonialism. We have to deal with this kind of experiential they, they change, reparations. They change the definition of it. And they'd say, well, if you're talking about sexual exploitation, actually it's mainly white men who do that. Well, I've that's, heard that. That's I because white Brits are still the over, overwhelming majority. But what they do is they change the definition. So what I'm being specific about, which is important because people will pick up on it, yeah. I'm talking about organized gang-based sexual exploitation, right? That's what I'm talking about. Right. Overwhelmingly, disproportionately committed by people who have arrived in the country relatively recently and who are overwhelmingly likely to be uh, Muslim Pakistani. Now, that's just one issue. I'm, I'm picking on that as an example of what we can't really begin to talk about well, Sweden, uh, within it's our catching national up to conversation. Yeah. Sweden, as well, is so interesting because it's both the left and the right in Sweden who now say openly, I was in Stockholm recently, and they, they both say, our experiment with mass migration has been a failure. And the center left in Sweden has just come out and said it would not row back the new restrictive migration policies that have been brought in by the right. And it's not just Sweden, Peter. If you look at Germany, Germany is now openly talking about deporting illegal migrants. And that's a left wing, uh, center left chancellor talking about this. Um, Maloney is 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 talking in a similar way. Border right. border controls have gone gone up in seven or eight countries now. The Schengen free movement area is basically now not no longer happening. And Marine Le Pen, okay. it's an important point. Marine Le Pen just passed um, a key piece of legislation in France, much more tougher restrictive immigration policies, and Macron couldn't stop it. So so the public mood here is basically overtaking the. Um, the reality of where liberals are. Okay, so this is going to sound like I'm being facetious, but I'm not being facetious. That's okay. And please help me understand something. I just cannot for the life of me fathom why anybody would have thought this was a good idea. Like, I just could not put myself in the headspace of, like, what on earth did you think was going to happen when you import literally millions of unskilled males, mm. young men from cultures in which, m- many of whom in which women wear cloth bags over their heads. Like, what did you think was good? Did they think that they would just kind of magically be liberalized and all of a sudden be, 
I mean, I just, I cannot imagine how anybody would think that that's anything other than an insane idea. But you've, you've worked on the radicalization of the cultural left. So yes. you know that for a certain strand within the left today, this isn't really about the objective reality of this issue. This is, a, this is feeding a much deeper desire, a kind of obsession with, with minority groups, an obsession with, with, with universalism, with the expansion of, as they see it, the expansion of the, the, the moral crusade. It's revolutionary in its, in its fervor. It's, it's, it's almost it's a missionary liberal nationalism. I 100% agree. And now that, that we're dealing with the consequences of that, why are they changing their minds? Well, I, I think in Britain, and also I, when I look at the Democrats, I see the same. I think actually a lot of them are just doubling down. I think the prospect of what is about to happen in 24 with a, a, a potentially a Donald Trump return to the White yeah. House. Think of, think of what you could see this year. Trump returns to the White House. A massive set of elections in Europe, European Parliament elections. Europe moves sharply to the right. Le Pen wins more seats. Maloney wins more seats. National populists do really, really well. And in Britain, most of the people who took a punt on Boris Johnson at the last election decide, you know what, I'm going to stay at home. I'm giving up. They said they would lower migration. They said they'd strengthen the borders. Nobody's serious about this. At the end of this year, see, I think politics could look fundamentally different. And liberals will respond to this, as they usually do, by putting their heads in the sand, by turning up the volume and saying, oh, it's a return of fascism, it's totalitarianism. They'll try and control yeah. the public debate. They'll try and narrow the social norms. They'll try and keep the Overton window where it is. And I just think I, it's they're just, going to yeah. have a very, very difficult 12 months. It's just, I mean, there really is something absolutely liberating about having a callous disregard for evidence. Right, yeah. I mean, I if, if you don't value evidence, know, then you just, you know, know. you know, none of that data means anything. You just talk about your personal experiences and your feelings and how everybody's a Nazi. It's, it's, it's so, it, it, the double standards. I mean, I'm still, still in the higher education university sector and, you know, whenever you release a study or a poll or a survey which points to problems associated with, let's say, migration, multiculturalism, it is torn apart by the expert class. Is the sample size big enough? Is the analysis robust? Yeah, but we're, that, okay, Was but, it peer reviewed? But see, they don't believe that. Is the research they don't, question. That's just verbal behavior because where, yeah. what neighbors do they live in Hampstead Heath? Where, where do they live? Well, for sure. It's a luxury belief class. It's a luxury yeah. belief. That's exactly And that's basically what what's happened. So if you've seen um, the strongest opponents of this Rwanda bill in Britain, right? Emma Thompson, yep. who has just achieved her lifelong ambition of moving to Venice, Italy. Yep. And uh, the actor Brian Cox from Succession, who spends most of his time in New York City, they were two of the most prominent critics of Rwanda. Now, they, to me, symbolize a luxury belief class because the effects of illegal migration for that group, um, they're not really going to feel them. They're not going to suffer the costs. By opposing control, they're winning status from other elites. It's the ordinary uh, man and woman on the street. It, it's the people in the northern communities that are having to host illegal migrants and asylum seekers who are going to suffer the highest cost. So the the luxury belief class, as Rob Henderson and others have talked about, you know, really either don't practice what they preach or they latch on to causes that they're not really ever going to feel the full effects of. And this is what I think many people are now beginning to realize, that they are now suffering the costs of this political project, which is, which is really hardwired to weaken, not strengthen, our society. And for, for international viewers, right, listeners, let me just give you one stat, which I find mind-boggling. If you look at the 2 million people that came into Britain over the last three or four years, what percentage of the 2 million people do you think came in to work, came in on a oh. skilled working visa of 2 million people. What percentage do you think very came small. in to work? Very small. I would guess very small. I sure. would guess uh, 10%. You're, you're very close. 15%. So so 85% of, the, of people coming into Britain were either the relatives of workers, international students, typically going to second-rate universities, coming in for a one-year MA program so mm. they can then get access to stay and work in the country, the relatives of international students, illegal migrants, refugees, and a few on other humanitarian routes. My, the key point is 
The Tories and the people who are running Britain have said, we now have a high skill immigration policy, which is bringing you, the British taxpayer, the best of the best, right? And it's controlled and it's limited. That ain't what we're getting. We've got a small contingent of workers who are now often earning less than the average worker in Britain. They're low skill, they're low wage. And then on top of that, we have an enormous number of people who basically aren't coming into work at all and who end up contributing to this delivery economy that we've got, a kind of gig economy. So why don't we have productivity in this country? Why don't we have more growth in this country? Why have we got this kind of crappy political economy based around cheap labor, usually from abroad, because it's keeping big business happy, it's keeping profits high, it's keeping costs low, and we just carry on with this broken economic model that is not serving anybody, most of all the British people, well at all. And we need to call it out. We need to say, look, it's not about being anti-immigration. It's just saying we can come up with a much better way of driving growth and productivity and social cohesion. The Australians have done it. More yeah, I, I, among many others. And instead, we seem to have a political class that just refuses to even talk about it. So if this is too personal of a question, you don't have to answer it. Is there any part of you who wants these people to succeed so that their generations of their offspring will suffer? Yes. There is a part of me as well. I want to see their progeny consigned to the life that they have built for them. Yes, and I, I feel the same way. I want, at the same time, I want the migration that we have to be controlled and limited because my personal worldview is one which says, look, in a world of difficult trade-offs and decisions, my, what my view personally is we have to prioritize people within the national community who have been here for a long period of time, who have paid into the collective pot over generations. That's my personal worldview, and it's where I depart from many of my liberal friends who are much more focused on universal rights and um, and so on. But that that's an acceptable difference, right? We don't need to go to war over that. But I'm still going to interrogate those people and say, show me the evidence that this is helping they, the country. No, of course, they don't. They're, they're, uh, look, there has to be a consequence to this b behavior. In a democracy, I was just arguing with Travis about this last night, there has to be a consequence. So if, let me give you an example. In the city of Portland, there's a Ted Wheeler, he, him, his is the mayor. The man is a public disgrace. Under, I, I won't go into the details, but under his watch, Portland has become a fetid cesspool, a mm. sewer of human filth, garbage, and violence. But bracketing that for a moment, the man running against, I don't think Ted Wheeler's running, is Rene Gonzalez. He's an inveterate, hardcore Democrat, leftist, impeccable leftist credentials. His car was firebombed in front of his house, his new car was firebombed. You don't kind of have that political violence that we're seeing more and more. Antifa is responsible for that, the militant organization of the uh, wing of the, far, of the far left. I'm, I'm bringing this up to you because I, the governor didn't mention it, the local news media didn't, mm. nobody mentioned it. Sure. And I'm bringing this up to you because there has to be a price to be paid by callous indifference. Mm. There has to be a price in a democracy paid for the way you vote. There mm. has to be a policy paid for the, for the proposals that you put forward. Mm. And the immigration policy in this country, among other things, and I, I hate to criticize as an outsider, I'm obviously an American, but it's so obviously deranged to me. Well, I'll give you an example of how that works here. In Ireland, we had riots recently right. um, in, in Dublin, uh, followed uh, you know, extreme violence that had been committed by asylum, asylum seekers um, uh, and migrants. And the, the, the debate um, among the mainstream elite class was about how the local residents who came right, out to protest exactly. were, were far right agitators, right. as opposed to the real cause of the disturbance and unrest was actually um, violence, sickening violence perpetrated by uh, migrants. And um, we, we watched a sort of elite class have this conversation. And then on Twitter, X, social media, everybody else was having this completely different conversation <laughs> about what was really going on. 
And I think now, you know, the emperor isn't wearing any clothes. We're in that kind of moment where because of the proliferation of media, new media, people can now see straight through these narratives. And yeah. uh, the idea that anybody who opposes migration, anybody who protests against some of these things is is automatically far right. I think that's a taboo. That's the, the social norm that is going to is going to now be um, blown apart in the years ahead because people won't really put up with that anymore. They want to have a conversation about these issues. There have been multiple uh, criminal acts, rapes, uh, murders committed by illegal migrants that have been downplayed in British media. They've been downplayed. Islamist violences too, by the way. Understandably, security services say they they sometimes don't want to provide you know, quote unquote, inspiration or a catalyst for other acts of violence. But we have to, as a society, be able to have a conversation right. about what is happening so, without downgrading content and without suppressing content um, that, and, that voters need to be able to see. And, and you, you alluded to it before, that the first step to solving any problem is to be honest about it, have conversations. Yeah. And for those people who don't like Donald Trump, you'll see what you're going to get when you have a truth People won't speak it because they're afraid. You know, you know, in the United States, it's, uh, I don't know if it still is anymore. We haven't been there for a while. But the big thing was every time there was an, there was an attack on Asians by African Americans, mm. immediately it would be white supremacists. Mm. This is white supremacists. And there weren't even white people involved. Mm. And it was a kind of, I liked, you know, I thought after our last conversation, I've been coming around to the... And I think I'm 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 there, if not virtually there, to this idea of an elite class, mm. a, a, a kind of managerial class, certainly an academic class that is primarily governed by luxury beliefs and other mm. such beliefs. But we're at the end. But I want to I want I'm I I want you to help me with something. So I'm man I'm I'm bearish I'm bearish I'm bearish on the West I'm bearish on the United States. You know Neil Ferguson has said that the Americans are always thinking it's the end of empire and the end of empire. It's a little different now is because we're running these crazy, crazy debts. So I have been a little bit, um, I know depressed might be too strong of a word, but I have been, I'm extremely pessimistic about a sure. wide variety of issues uh, fa facing us. And I was hoping you could give me something, not a Pollyanna optimism, but you, you are a Pollyanna kind of um Evidence based. Can, can, tell me, tell me, so leave me the with something. The reason for optimism. Yeah, like what, like, but the, a real reason for optimism. Yeah, okay. I am, I, I, bizarrely, I, so I used to be a, a, a sort of fully committed liberal lefty. I used to write for The Guardian. I used oh, to God. work for think tanks and most of my academic mates uh, who remember and they always say, you know, God, what happened to Matt? What happened? And I, I've been on a political journey where I've just become increasingly aware of the inherent limits, problems, contradictions, and challenges within liberalism uh, as an ideology, and also specifically within radical progressivism. And I've seen it firsthand, uh -huh. and I've become increasingly disillusioned with the inability or the refusal of people on the, the left, the liberal left, the radical left, to compromise with anybody, uh, to, 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 to even acknowledge and respect their fellow citizens, you know, with, with, with respect. And, and for me, the radicalizing moment was Brexit, was seeing the reaction to the majority of voters who had simply said, we don't want to be in this club of nations anymore. We'd like to, we fancy our chances at going alone, actually. We'd like to be a self-governing independent nation. And the reaction among the elite class to voters really radicalized me. You know, they were stupid, they were racist, they were idiots, they were gammons, they were morons. And I mean, I knew I, I knew a lot of Brexit voters. I come from a working class background. What I was witnessing in Oxford and Cambridge and elsewhere was sickening, actually. It was really disgusting. And then to watch the radicalization of the left over the last 10 years, the kind of great awakening, where everybody is basically a Nazi, a far right fascist, simply for saying, I don't think this model is working for ordinary people anymore. Uh, that as well, I think, has pushed me in a in a mm. slightly different direction. But I am optimistic in a number, just yeah, for a couple of reasons. After the, the October 7th attacks, I think there are two things you can no longer seriously, credibly, plausibly deny. Number one is we have a fundamental problem in Western societies with multiculturalism uh, and mass immigration. I don't think you can now stand up and say that's not true. It's visible to everybody. We've all seen the protests. We've all seen the demonstrations. We've all seen the anti-Semitism. We've all seen the reaction of, of people within our communities who, to be blunt, hate us, right? We've created that 
I don't think we you can have. Av- I don't think we can avoid that anymore. And the second thing is, you can no longer say we do not have a problem in the universities and the institutions because it is now obvious to everybody from Harvard and the DEI scandal to what we've seen in universities across Britain, which fell over themselves to um, uh, align themselves with George Floyd and then said next to nothing after the October 7th attacks uh, to express solidarity with British Jews. I think everybody can now see the institutions for what they are. That gives me optimism because it means within that admission, within that acknowledgement. Uh, Acknowledgement of corruption as well. Yeah, but we can have a different debate, which is, okay, how are we going to fix this? How are we actually going to reform the institutions, put in place different policies for issues like migration and integration? How can we move these these big legacy institutions so they're closer to the people? That gives me, I think, a cause for optimism too. Uh, and, and fundamentally, you know, voters aren't idiots. Like they can see what is happening and they are slowly, I think, waking up to what has been happening over the last 10 years. And Brexit also restored confidence in a way because what it did is it put popular sovereignty on steroids. The Mm -hmm. people had Mm -hmm. to finish what the elite class couldn't do, right? They voted for Brexit, the elites couldn't handle it, Mm. And then the people had to solve it by ele- electing Boris Johnson and a conservative government with a with an 80 seat majority. Ultimately, it will be the people who will end up projecting their values, their voice, their views onto the system. And it will come in all kinds of forms and shapes. But I have, over the last decade, a renewed sense of confidence, actually, uh, with with ordinary people. Wow, Matt Goodwin, thank you so much. It's thanks for, always thanks my for having me. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for watching. Everything we do is under the umbrella of the National Progress Alliance, nationalprogressalliance.org. It's a nonprofit, independent 501c3. Your generous donations keep us going and keep fueling content like this. So please help us out, make a donation. We very much appreciate it. Thank you.